Hello, my name is Gary Greenberg. I want to welcome you all to the EMS webinar, Focus on Panfocal Microscopy. Um, if you happen to have 3D glasses, uh, please have them ready for a little bit later in the show. Um, also, if there are any questions during the presentation that you might have, you can post them on the chat and we can get them at the end, uh, talk with them at the end of the presentation during the during the Q&A. Um, all attendees are going to receive a 10% discount on the software and you'll be getting a um, uh, an email relating to that discount. So let's begin the webinar on edge 3D panfocal microscopy. So here's the agenda. What is 3D panfocal microscopy? Basically, it is a plug and play accessory that converts your 2D microscope into 3D. It gives you confocal-like results at a fraction of the price. Now, the great thing about this is that it's compatible with almost all 2D microscopes, whether it's inverted or fluorescence or reflected or transmitted. It works with <clears throat> systems such as phase contrast. Um, most 3D microscopes, as long as you have a focus knob that can be attached to a prior focus device and a camera. Um, it's easy to install and simple to use. It essentially consists of the Edge 3D panfocal software and the prior scientific focus device that hooks up to the focus knob on your 2D microscope. So basically, the Edge panfocal software controls the camera and it controls the focus to automate Z-focus stacking. So now, instead of taking just one picture, it takes multiple pictures. So this is a, what the software uh, interface looks like. And you can see on the left side bottom, that's where we focus. So there's a slider. You can, set, you can focus in several different ways. So the way it works is you focus on the top of the specimen, and you set the current position. You focus on the bottom of the specimen, set the end, and then basically you just say take a stat, and then... The whole thing is in focus. It takes multiple pictures. In this case, it took um, 25 pictures and uh, in 30 steps um, because it was 750 microns deep. And that information is available to you there in the deep focus mode. So once it's there, then the thing is, is how do you visualize 3D information? What are the best methods for, um, uh, for visualizing and, and publishing your results. So basically you publish results similar to the way you would in a confocal microscope. You do a reconstruction of the Z-stack. So here is an example of that. That was a, this um, die cutter. You basically just show it as a 2D reconstruction of a three-dimensional object. The other way is to give a link to a little video or do a little animated GIF and then you can see it in 3D using rotational 3D video loop. And that gives you all the hidden depth information that you wouldn't see otherwise. You can present those at meetings or send them as links in your publication. You can also present the results as a color depth map, which shows you the measurement of the object in X, Y, and Z. At a glance, you can quickly get a quantification of what you're photographing. Another way is to do a surface profile model, and you can tilt these in pretty much any direction you want and look at it from a particular angle, which can be advantageous. And the, another way is to see it in stereo 3D. Now, if you happen to have your stereo glasses, you can put them on with the red on the left eye, and you'll see that kind of pops out at the screen to you. Um, there's only one picture here, so you can put the glasses away again. Or sorry, this is the 40s. If you still have the glasses, this combines both stereo and motion parallax at the same time. So if you have your glasses on, it looks almost a bit like a hologram. So what are the benefits of 3D? Why do we need 3D? Problem with microscopes is they're a very shallow depth of field, and this produces sampling errors. All you can see is a tiny bit of the specimen at one time. Well, this is really a problem for something like a cell. So cells are... Uh, or for anything, really, most objects we photograph in a microscope are actually three-dimensional. Uh, a cell, for example, is, is 10 to 20 microns in diameter, but most histologists are cutting cells five micron sections. So you're only seeing a fraction of the diameter of a single cell. 
what we do here is we make multiple pictures. So we, we look at 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 150 microns. So you see groups of cells and how they interact with one another. So the important thing about 3D, why 3D? Is you overcome the depth of field problem. That improves your diagnoses. It increases productivity because you're seeing everything at one time. Instead of making, you know, a whole bunch of five micron sections, you make a couple of hundred micron sections and you see everything in 3D at one time. And this reveals the hidden depth information. And that's really the important thing. Now, we know that 3D imaging is, revolutioning micro is revolutionizing microscopy. Um, the confocal like microscopes or confocal microscopes and all those very expensive 3D microscopes that have become very popular since the turn of, the, of, of, the, of this century um, have revolutionized not only biomedical science, but has changed the way um, industry looks at things. So uh, Keyens and, and Hyrox uh, have been promoting their 3D systems and they've done extremely well. Uh, and we can do the similar things to them, but a fraction of the cost, and we can do it on your existing 2D microscope. So who are the people that really need people such as you in neurobiology or pathology? biopsies, plant biology, biomedical. There's all kinds of applications. As long as you're looking at a three-dimensional object in your microscopes, this is going to give you much more information. So let me just show you some application examples um, in research, industry, and biomedicine. So one of the first things you can do is you have a fluorescence microscope. You can now turn that fluorescence microscope into a non-confocal 3D imaging system. It will be very similar. The results can be very similar to a confocal microscope, uh, except that you're not using lasers. You're using uh, LED. Uh, uh, you're using what your existing illumination system. So here, for example, is a um, 300 micron thick brain slice that's been cleared. This is the 2D image of it. And here in 3D, you can see you get much more depth of field. And with the rotation, you can see the foreground from the background. Here's a Hair, a hair root, and you can see in 2D, this is stained with DAPI, so it stains for DNA. So those blue, those are the blue cells and the root of the hair that are stained for DNA. Now in 3D, you've taken the stack, now you see the whole root hair, what it really looks like, you see all the cells and you see the shape of it. Here in microelectronic example, here's focus on, in, in one spot, but obviously there's much more to the, to the object, and now you really see what's there, all in one shot. Uh, here's uh, in manufacturing, very important, this is Velcro. So look at this Velcro. Um, this is about a, a, almost a millimeter thick, and you're seeing the whole thing in 3D, and the hooks get, those are the hooks, and the loops, they're plastic loops that get caught in the hooks, and that's how the Velcro works, and then they pull apart, because those hooks are pliable. We're looking at surface profiling. Um, uh, this is a 2D picture of a tool marking, and here it is in 3D. It reveals the hidden depth information. It gives you all the information in one go, so you can really, really analyze what's happening with your specimen. You can also see what that looks like as a color depth map, so now that can be clearly quantified. Um, and so you can pair... Uh, these quantified images one to the other. This is in geology. This is looking at the uh, at a 2D image of a of a of a meteorite, and there it is in 3D. Uh, much more information. Here's a some moon dust, a little bit of uh, moon dust from the Apollo uh, 13 mission, and look here it is in 3D. That's a compressed image, and there's the rotational image. And in plant biology, which is a very important um, application because you're really looking at 3D objects here a lot. This is the uh, stamen of a water hyacinth in, in 2D. And look what it looks like in 3D. Now you can see all the trichomes. You see the pollen. You see the anther is opened up. Gives you a lot more information. For, uh, for oceanography and marine biology, this is a foraminifera. And now in 3D, you see this foraminifera. This is a little protist. Um, 
an amazing little thing that, that becomes a grain of sand. This is a tiny little thing that becomes a grain of sand once they die. Uh, for entomology, here's a 2D picture of a little tiny uh, gnat, fungus gnat. And here it is in 3D. Brain and neuro neurobiology is a, is, a, is a really, I guess, a no-brainer. Sorry for the pun. But um, it's really important, 3D and neurobiology. And neurobiology is one of the first adapters of confocal uh, uh, methodology. So here's a 2D image of a, of a, a 135 micron brain slice, and here it is in 3D. So you see the processes, what's in the foreground, you see really everything clearly. Now, if you happen to have the 3D glasses, now would be the time to put them on. So I'm just going to show you a couple of similar applications, but in this 4D mode. Because in the 4D mode, you get both, you get both the um, rotation and the stereo. So I know if you don't have the glasses on, you're seeing it in 3D because of the tilting back and forth. But if you have the glasses on also, it, it's the amount of hidden information that's revealed is, is, is dramatic. So these are some of the same images we've looked at. But now if you have the glasses, you can see them. This is a spirulina. By the way, you can write away for glasses. We're happy to send you glasses so that you can see what this looks like on the replay. Um, this will be posted later. Um, but this added information is really dramatic. This is the little micrometeorite. And you can see that it's hollow. And with the 3D glasses, you really get a more dramatic image. OK, so you can take the 3D glasses off. So let's continue a little bit um, about how to set up the system. It's very easy to set up the system. You start with the connecting the prior focus device to your microscope's focus knob. So essentially, I think I've got a picture of it here. There it is, the focus knob. This is a, an Olympus, old Olympus microscope sitting there. You put that over like that, and you tighten it down, and now you connect that to the software. So this is our software. You're going to need a PC uh, with Windows 10, or actually it can, it can have a – it'll work with Windows 7, actually, on, onward. Um, but you'll need a good graphics card, uh, and, um, and this is what the interface looks like, and it controls the focus movement. Now, also, you can add an optional oblique 3D illuminator. So we've, we've designed and invented this 3D oblique illuminator, which gives you real-time 3D, and it gives the ability to create a, a sharper image using oblique illumination. So let me show you what prior makes this uh, illuminator. So the illuminator can go either on your reflected light microscope uh, as a vertical illuminator, or it can go on your transmitted light microscope for biological or transmitted light applications. Here's the benefits of this oblique illuminator. It has four LED oblique lights. And what they do is they enhance contrast, they increase resolution, improves depth of field, and it produces real-time 3D stereo. Um, so let me show you some of these uh, um, benefits and how they work. First of all, it's a powerful contrast enhancement system. Uh, oblique illumination it, uh, gives you highlights and shadows you couldn't otherwise see. So this is radiolaria using all the lights, which is similar to a regular 2D illuminator. But when you use just the northwest light alone, all of a sudden this is what you see. You can get the contrast, the highlighting and shadowing that allows you to see those radiolaria uh, images. And then you can do the stack, and then you can see it in rotating 3D. The illuminator also increases resolution. It allows the objective lens to capture higher order diffraction wavelengths. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes here talking a little bit about the resolution of light microscopes. It was Ernst Dobby who came up with the, re with the formula for the resolution of light microscopes. And it was not the, it was not the quality of the lens that, uh, that limited the resolution of light microscopes, it was, it was the fact that diffraction of light limits it. But the interesting thing is, is that it's the diffraction of light that's necessary in order to see something. So, and Avi realized this. So if you look at these muscle cells, 
on the left. These are striated muscle cells, and you can see the striations. If you were to take the eyepiece out of your microscope and look straight down the objective lens, you'd be looking into the back aperture of the objective lens, and this is what you'd see. You'd see that diffraction pattern. So this is the diffraction pattern that's created by that object right there. And Avi said that that diffraction pattern transforms itself into the into the object that we see, into the image. And that's also known as a Fourier transform mathematically. So you can see the zero order, the first order, and the second order. Now here's the deal. As the objects get smaller, the diffraction wavelengths spread out larger. So here's a smaller object. Here's a diatom amphibore. This is a Tripler sigma angulatum with 0.5 micron spacings. So now you can see the zero orders in the center, and you get one, you only get the first order. The second order wavelets are not captured by the objective lens. They fall outside of the objective lens. So you get the image. But what happens if the spaces get smaller, the object gets smaller, then you can no longer see the diffraction wavelet. So look at the top left. This is Amphipura pellucida that has 200 by 200. And 50 nanometer markings. Well, what's happening on the top left, you're not seeing the markings because the objective lens is only getting the zero order and it's not getting the first order. But as you look at the bottom left diagram, as you tilt or get oblique illumination, you get the zero order on one side of the objective lens and the first order on the other side of the objective lens. And all of a sudden, you can see the lines, those lines right there on the top right, which are 250 microns spaced apart. Now, if you use double oblique illumination, you can get the full thing. Um, <clears throat> double oblique meaning from two right from to right angles to one another. So here on the top is single oblique illumination, and you can see in this case we have the zero order on the bottom right of the uh, aperture and the first order, and now we have the second order, giving better resolution. But if you in mainly in that direction, uh, if you have multiple oblique luminaries from two angles at 90 degrees, such as here, you create two diffraction patterns which interfere with one another, and you get resolution around the entire XY plane. So um, one of the other really important things about multiple oblique illumination is the ability to get live real-time 3D. And this is important for things like if you're doing micromanipulation, microrecording, in vitro fertilization, those kinds of things, or if you're looking at stuff like, like um, 3D um, um, cell cultures and so forth. The oblique, laner, the oblique illuminator produces superior images in cell culture. This is the closure of the neural tube using a single oblique illuminator. Uh, and it works with the uh, oblique illumination works with plastic dishes, so you don't need, which does not work with DIC. DIC, uh, the image is destroyed using plastic dishes, so this is a real advantage. It, these are some cancer cells in culture. Here's a 3D uh, cell culture preparation, and you can see it all in 3D. This is a reflected light application for um, these oblique illuminator. So I think we've gone through the whole thing now. What I'd like to do. Hopefully, we have some questions, possibly, that have come up. But we've gone over what panfocal microscopy is and hopefully how it can benefit the research and the work that you all are doing. Um, so if we have any questions, uh, hopefully, I can provide some of these answers. Uh, let me see. Hi, uh, John, are there any questions? Yeah, so Gary, we've got a question. Uh, how much can can we rotate the image? Uh, the image can be rotated up to um, the act. You, you have control of the angle of rotation. And the rotation is going to be depend the amount, of, the amount of angle that you can get on it. It's going to depend on several things. Number one, the resolution of the camera that you're using. The higher resolution the camera, the more angle of rotation you can get. And the other thing is the number of stacks, the number of images in the stack that you're taking. So if you have a, a stack with, let's say, 
30, Im uh, 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 30 images in the stack, you can get more rotation than if you have, say, 10 images in the stack. So it depends much on the specimen and how the specimen is collected. But that's a very good, very good question. In the 3D model mode, you can get complete rotation, but there's a huge amount of smoothing uh, that goes on. But if you want to get the rotation that still keeps it very um, accurate in terms of the um, the the the, the, um, the image that you're looking at, it it depends on those on those factors. So uh, that's the answer to that question. Are there any other questions, or is there enough follow up on that? Uh, well, no, there's no follow up. Uh, there's a couple of questions uh, concerning. Um, whether the illuminator can work on on some specific microscopes. One is an Olympus BX41. I looked online at that, and I believe it should work with that. OK, let's just look here. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys what the cost is. OK, this is the cost of the software. We're giving a 10% discount um, uh, uh, on the uh, cost of the software. And here's the list of which microscope did you say? Oh, it's an Olympus BX, so it looks like it works there. Olympus BX, yes, for sure. For sure. It'll make your Olympus BX a super microscope. You'd be very pleased with its performance. And um, somebody was asking about a dissecting microscope. There are, if you put it on a dissecting microscope, it's a different drive. For the so let's look here. So the normal drive or uh, is for compound microscopes is thirty four hundred dollars. That's the second item in this list here. That's the prior scientific Z focus, and it's for upright microscopes. But if you have a stereo microscope, you can see depending on which stereo microscope it is, it's a more expensive um, drive because there's it, it, there's more torque required to turn. Uh, the knob on a dissecting microscope. So yes, it will work on a dissecting microscope, uh, and and uh, it's a little bit more expensive for the for the and and there's another one for the Nikon NF uh, NM400 microscope. That's also a dissecting microscope uh, or a, a low power type microscope. So yes, it can work on a dissecting microscope. Here are, uh, if you need to get a hold of, of, of any uh, of electron microscopy sciences, or if you have any uh, questions about te technological questions, you can contact me at the information below. Were there any other, John? No, that's it. OK. Thank you so much all for joining the webinar today. Uh, again, if you have any questions, there's the information below. If you'd like to be sent a pair of 3D glasses, we're happy to do that. Uh, just contact us. So thank you very much, and have a good day.